Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Bible study, our Call to Christ Church Bible study, where our aim is to focus on the Bible. And after our month hiatus, I think we, uh, we are back. This time we are going to start with our topic of speaking in tongues and what they are and to become more informed about it rather than a debate. So let's start off with, uh, once again, I right, welcome back Pastor Pagey and myself. My name is Maria. And if you have any questions or comments or about anything we talk about today previously or you would like to sp for us to speak about, please leave your comments below or you can message us privately on our uh, Call to Christ Church group page as well. So as we begin, what would you say, what is the origin of this concept of speaking in tongues? Well, um, biblically, the speaking in tongues, uh, we see the Christian biblical uh, speaking in tongues in the book of Acts uh, after Pentecost. Uh, but we have record of pagan uh, speaking in tongues that goes back prior to that. If I can interject, if you could elaborate on Pentecost for those who are unaware of Easter and okay. or anything. All right. That are uh, Pentecost, uh, the history of Pentecost, is, uh, it is a Jewish holiday, uh, which comes uh, 50 days uh, after the third feast of uh, the, the, the Jewish feasts uh, in the first month uh, of the Jewish calendar. And uh, the word uh, Pentecost, P E N. Uh, like Pentagon means five-sided building, Pentateuch means five books of the Bible. The word Pentecost is the 50th five, 50th day after the last feast. Um, and uh, it was a time of uh, celebration of God's fulfillment of his promise uh, to the Hebrew people. And so they used to, uh, they used to celebrate the feast of uh, Pentecost uh, after uh, we had uh, the, 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 the Passover, then the Feast of uh, 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 the, the, the First Fruits. I'm confusing between the Jewish names and the, and the English names. First Fruits, and we had the Feast of uh, 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 Sheaf. The, then we had the Feast of uh, Pentecost. And so, in that Jewish calendar, uh, at the time of, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, we have 50 days after that when all the disciples were meeting at uh, the same place where Jesus had, had communion with uh, the disciples in the upper room. We have record that there was about 120 people there. In fact, 820 people there. The Last uh, Supper, right? Pardon me? The Last Supper? Or yeah, the it one was, it was, after? It was after the Last Supper. The Last Supper was prior to the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, after the resurrection of Christ, uh, the disciples all met uh, in the same room, but it was not just the 12 disciples, it was 120 disciples, which is the, uh, the, the beginning of the new church. And at that time, the Holy Spirit came upon the people uh, in the form of a dove, and we're told that they see flames of fire, and the people began to speak in tongues. There is some confusion about what that means when they say speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Now, there are those who today believe that the speaking in tongues that we see today that we witness in Pentecostal churches, uh, which is often referred to as gibberish or glossolalia. Glossolalia is uh, a tongue that nobody really understands. That's and there are those who believe these are, this is a language of heaven, that angels understand it, that God understands it. Uh, and it is, they, they believe it is a... Uh, evidence of the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is a tongue that humans don't speak? No, the human stone uh, speaking, that was uh, at the time when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the people were getting angry. People meaning the, the, the Jewish priests were getting angry. Mm -hmm. They were getting angry because the song of Hosanna that they were singing on the way to, the, uh, to Jerusalem uh, that the people were singing was the same song that the priests used to sing when they brought in the sacrificial lamb at Passover. So mm -hmm. on the Day of Atonement, uh, five days before the Day of Atonement, 
They used to bring this lamb into their homes and then get ready to sacrifice it. And so when people said, uh, the, 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 the chief priest told the people to stop singing, Jesus said, if I stop them from singing, even the stones will sing. What he was making reference to was non-believers. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Jews referred to Gentiles and more specifically the Samaritans as stones. Uh, they were not the same as human. Just any non any non Jewish specifically human, yeah. Samaritans. Okay, they were the worst as far as the Jews were concerned. So the reference you're uh, talking about, pardon me, about the, the stones will speak. That is to uh, that group of people. That uh, Jesus didn't literally mean that the stones from the road are going to start talking, but that the, the Jews don't speak, mm -hmm. the Samaritans will start praising. God and praising Him. So that was that. But now, what happens today is many Christians are told that uh, speaking in unintelligible languages mm -hmm. is a gift from God. But the question comes up, that, is that a biblical teaching or not? Mm -hmm. And I think that is an important question. Unintelligible tongues. So that is, as you said, the lang a language that uh, of, is of angels and of God, or is that just specific to that, or just anything people can't understand it? So like you said, is it just going to gibberish? Because mm -hmm. gibberish is just literally whatever. There's no... If we were to, if we were to respond to somebody's uh, claim that this is the language uh, of heaven and of angels, then we have to go back and question uh, the doctrine of God revealing himself to us. In other words, the difference between non-biblical religion and the biblical religion is that in the Bible, God reveals himself to humans. In the pagan religions, they create a God in the form of a man, mm -hmm. and they have the habits and characteristics of a man. What? It's made up. Now, with God, he reveals himself. Now, if God is going to reveal himself, is he going to do that in a language that is not understandable? That doesn't mean that God, God in order for God to reveal himself, means he has to be communicate, we have to understand. When you, when you say reveal, um, I think that itself is beyond what we understand. Because what we understand as Christians growing up is that God is beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. So when we say reveal, you expect something understandable, something tangible. Mm -hmm. So there's no absolute re re revelation to us in that any, any manner throughout the Bible. Even when Moses saw God on, on Mount Sinai, he was gone for many days to the point where people saw he was dead. So there was no absolute revelation to us. So why would the concept of speaking in tongues con uh, even exist? Okay. Uh, that, speaking of tongues is uh, somewhat related to what you're saying. But the issue of whether or not God reveals himself to us or could reveal himself is a, is a different uh, discussion, but I'll, I'll, I'll address it briefly. Uh, to say that God did not or cannot reveal himself to us is really limiting God. I'll tell you why. We know as Christians that there are three ways that God can be seen. One is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. John chapter 17 says, this is life eternal that you know the only true God. Well, if the life eternal is knowing the only true God, that means we, there's a way for us to get to know him. Now, Jesus uh, tells us, the Bible tells us, the character of God is given to us in the law, in the moral law. Mm -hmm. God is perfect, God is loving, God is gentle, all that stuff. But the personification of God's character is seen in Jesus. Jesus says, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Whatever you've seen, the disciples say to him, uh, we want to see the Father. Mm -hmm. How can we see the Father? And he said, how is it possible that you have, you, you've seen me and you say you haven't seen the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But is that you, an absolute revelation? It is. So, it you is could, you, so you're saying that as, if we can understand the Bible in its entirety, we, have, we know God. We and do. if we can understand Jesus, we have become to understand Absolutely. Jesus. Yeah. But that is beyond our comprehension as humans. We cannot understand pure, such purity because we are made through sin. We, we don't understand the purity. We understand that's part of what, we, what we're told is that we accept, uh, we accept Jesus as our Savior by faith. But we have record 
of who Jesus was, what he did, how he responded to sin, how he responded to people, how he responded to mean people, the, those that were in trouble. All those loving, gentle characteristics of Jesus is what defines God. The third place is the nature. But then we go, if you go a little, uh, I think that speaking in tongues, if you speak of it as a revelation, is impossible in the sense that we cannot come to understand God completely. Just going psychologically, your experiences differ from mine. Even if we live an exact same life, we're given the same nurture, or, or, or from the birth from the same parents, we le lead different lives, and we all come to know God in a different way. Yep. And if, we, if God is a part of each and every one of us, and I can't even completely understand you as a human being, and you're the same species as I am, how can I understand some, the person who made me? Mm -hmm. uh, the objective is to know not the, first of all, there is no physical, uh, physica physicality to God. There is no restrictions. There's no, God is a spirit. Mm -hmm. So we can't understand that what we know in a three-dimensional world. We cannot understand that part of it. But what is important is the characteristics of God. The characteristics of God are not difficult to understand. Why? Because we see those in the life and words of Jesus Christ. That's not difficult to But seeing and understanding is quite different. Yeah, well, we, we don't need to see. Because uh, uh, Moses said he wanted to see God. And God said no. So no one has seen God and nobody, nobody's ever going to see God. But the revelation that we need is enough for us to gain redemption and to gain salvation. But I think we're veering away from the question of tongues. How is that related to tongues? Now, when people say that this is the language of God, I think they're mistaken. Why? Because we have to understand why uh, the speaking in tongues was used and what was it that happened at that Pentecost? When the Holy Spirit came, did people speak in tongues that were not understood by others? They That's were understood. It. They were understood. So, and what was the purpose behind the speaking in tongues? So they may go and preach to others. So they may preach to others and when everybody spoke in the actual definition is this, or the description is this. When the disciples spoke in their own language, others understood it in their own language. Mm -hmm. Everybody understood it. And the purpose for that miracle was to spread the gospel. Now, keep in mind, every miracle that Jesus and the apostles were involved in was for the purpose of spreading the good news of the gospel. That was the entire purpose. It was not that I could gain something and become sighted or become hearing, or uh, become healthy, or be raised from the dead. It was not for my own benefit. It was for the benefit of the world that through seeing the miracles, people would believe in the words. It was the words that gave salvation, not the miracles. Let's see, through the miracle to be believing, isn't that opposite of what Jesus taught? What do you mean? To believe without seeing? No, Jesus in fact said that, uh, I believe it's Matthew 5, that uh, this is evidence of my surety that God is the one who gave me the message. Now, he did say to some of the non-Jews that I have not seen such faith even in Jerusalem because some people be, uh, believed Jesus mm -hmm. without evidence. So he did. So that would be ideal, but that wasn't uh, the, the, the objective did, of the miracles. But then what is the point of Jesus saying, blessed is he who believed without seeing? And I. I know I read it. I don't know which passage, but it, he's said it. And I mean, what is the, we've always believed that us believing without seeing is something absolute, which is why we resist idols. Mm -hmm. We resist anything because we're not supposed to objectify anything. We're not supposed to put our belief in one sacred thing. Even the cross is just a symbol of our belief. Mm -hmm. We do not put it or paganize. We do not go to church so we can see the cross. Mm -hmm. We pray directly to God. Correct. Our connection to church or anything is without there, we're not putting any symbolism in anything. Mm -hmm. So what is, you know? I'm trying to, <laughs> I relate, think I'm, I'm trying to relate this question to the question of tongues. <laughs> so, well, so we stay on track. We stay on track, but if, if there's revelation or in any of this, or if speaking in tongues even is a valid thing, then wouldn't the whole concept of Pentecostal and everything happen there kind of not make sense with what Jesus taught? Why was that no, miracle required but, for people to believe? Because people came from all over the world. Wasn't it and rather it to understand rather than seeing? To understand. Yeah. And so when 
if they had uh, began to speak in Aramaic and there were Ethiopians there and they wouldn't understand, there would not be conversion. But people understood. The point is that God uses miracles for the furtherance of his gospel, for the good news. God uses the miracle here and in every other place for the furtherance of the gospel. What happens in today's understanding of Pentecostal speaking in tongues is that nobody really understands what people are saying. But this is not just happening here. This was also happening at the time of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, because they were doing a bunch of things they were not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And in chapter, from chapter 12, 13, and 14, those three chapters, the Apostle Paul begins to discuss the question of speaking in tongues. There are those who think that chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians is what they call the love chapter, but it really isn't a love chapter. What it is, is, a, is an explanation and preparation for chapter 14, which explains the speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. In chapter 12, he says, I've heard that there are people here who are speaking in unknown tongues. He says, now, if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, what value is there in that? Nobody understands. If you're just speaking to yourself and you're edifying yourself. You're not edifying one person. Mm -hmm. So he says, that if you are looking for gifts, look for a gift of helping people, of doing different things, and he talks about love. Mm -hmm. And he says, all these gifts are important, but the most important in chapter 13 is love. Yeah. Then in chapter 14, he goes back and says, if you must speak in tongues, mm -hmm. these unintelligible tongues, only do it in public if there is somebody there who can interpret it. There's if they're not, don't. Then if you're going to do it, do it one at a time. But instead of that, he says, pray instead for the gift of prophecy. What does it mean by gift of prophecy? It doesn't mean to foretell the future. In this context, the gift of prophecy is to preach. He says, pray for the gift of preaching the gospel rather than speaking in tongues. Don't think that speaking in tongues is a gift that's going to promote or edify God or edify the church in any way. There's two different ways speaking in tongues is written. There's tongues and just simply that, and then there's strange tongues mm -hmm. in chapter 14. Does, what is the difference then? Is the tongue something that's like the disciples did and were able to preach? But then that to us in modern day is just regular speaking. Mm -hmm. And strange tongues would translate to gibberish? Yeah. Uh, strange tongues, there, the one tongues was what we saw in the book of Acts, which people can understand. Mm -hmm. Meaning people from other uh, countries can understand in their own language. Strange is inexplicable. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem. When we look at the speaking in tongues in Pentecostal churches today, uh, we find their beginnings in, uh, well, the current Pentecostal church, the Alliance churches, uh, like to point to 1906 as the date when they begin this public speaking in tongues in a place in uh, Los Angeles called, uh, there was a house there called uh, Azusa, on Azusa Street, I think it's 306 Azusa Street in 1906. And uh, there was a uh, pastor that moved there from Texas who had been instructed by another pastor named Charles Parham who had experienced speaking in tongues in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. So if you know the geography of America, <laughs> we have Texas and above Texas we have Oklahoma, above Oklahoma we have Kansas. Mm -hmm. So this guy in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas, this guy had experience speaking in unintelligible tongues, Charles Parham. He then went to Texas and in Texas he began to mix with some other people. There he found a pastor who was a black pastor who was blind in one eye and he showed him and trained him in the understanding of speaking in tongues who then moved by train to Los Angeles and there in that church actually what happened was he went to church where the church had called him to be the pastor but when he got there they shut the door they didn't want the pastor to come in they didn't want him as the pastor mm -hmm. so he hired a house and in that house he began to have prayer meetings and meetings and so on 
there as people came, that house was shared by not only this, by this pastor, it was shared by some other people who were also at the same time uh, 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 conducting seances. You know what seances are? No. Seances are where spiritualists call for the spirit of the dead to come and speak to them. Why? Why? They were just a mixed group of people. And so they were <laughs> mostly people that were from uh, Africa. There was group, a group of spiritists from uh, Russia that were there, uh, immigrants. And so at the same time, over a period of several days, there was spiritism taking place there. And then loud singing and dancing, supposedly Christian, and that is where we have the first example of the modern recorded speaking in tongues and gibberish, what we call today gibberish. Oh, uh, uh, so. Oh, if wait I... a minute. There's a little more. Okay. <laughs> Scientists, after that, and researchers have gone to uh, spirit worshipers in Africa, where they have uh, nature worship, and in India, and in certain parts of uh, Russia, where they have uh, tribes out in the mountains and hills where they still have this gibberish speaking in tongues. And they recorded it. And they brought it back. Mm -hmm. And it is the same as what we find in the Pentecostal churches. The unintelligible, same, same basic verbiage. So uh, is there truth, verbiage. In, in your opinion, is, it, is there truth to speaking in tongues in this day and age? I don't believe it is from God. Uh, because if it was from God, you wouldn't have hardcore Hindus Having uh, and not along with the tongues comes this ecstatic experience of rolling on the floor and uh, being possessed mm -hmm. uh, in Africa, in India, in Russia, in many, and it's all documented. And so, in fact, uh, the, the the same uh, group also took the taped uh, conversations of speaking in tongues from these pagan uh, spirit worshippers and took them to Christians, supposedly Christian Pentecostals. And they said they recognize it. And there were some who claimed that they have the spirit of interpretation. So they asked various people to interpret in various locations, and it was all different. So I don't believe that God would be a God of confusion. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tells us, Paul says clearly, God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of order. Mm -hmm. And if God wanted to give somebody a gift, there would be a purpose for it. And we find that purpose in the book of Acts. And that purpose was for the spreading of the gospel, not for the sake of edifying ourselves. So, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, as far as the, 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 the speaking in tongues that we see today, oh, by the way, I should say that we do have, uh, we do have record of uh, what they call the holiness movement. The holiness movement was in the 17 and 1800s, mostly in the 1800s. This was what we also call the temperance movement. This mm -hmm. was when people decided they were all going to be holy and righteous and live righteous lives. And uh, there were groups even that eventually became Seventh-day Adventists, the group that I grew, I grew up in. There were um, actually ancestors of these same groups and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, because all three come from the same background. Mm -hmm. that their ancestors were people who were also speaking in tongues and that was long before 1901 or 1906. So we have evidence of people speaking, we have record of people speaking in unintelligible tongues. But it doesn't verify the, like, the absolute, absolute honesty of it because there is nothing. Whether, I mean, I guess the easy way to put it is whether you speak gibberish now or 2,000 years ago, it's gibberish or gibberish to gibberish. It is gibberish, yeah. So how could something nonsense or not intelligible carry through so easily? Uh, it is, when you say carry through, what do you mean by that? How, why does it like, grow? Like, how can, like, you, if I believe that if, or I assume at least, which is probably not the greatest word to use, but um, that if I as a Christian became a Pentecostal and I believed in the concept of talking in tongues, I would want to know where the origin comes from. How can I achieve that? And when would I know that I have been able to achieve it? Yes. Uh, there are, in fact, people who teach how to speak in tongues and prepare people for how to speak in tongues and get ready for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, supposedly, because that's the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, according to them. Uh, but we know 
that uh, we, uh, when we are gifted by God, in the matter of speaking in tongues, the evidence tells us, both in the book of Acts and also by the Apostle Paul in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that the objective is to not be involved in the gibberish uh, speaking in tongues. He clearly says, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, they're still there. Yes, they, they still do it. Yeah. The reason they do it is people don't study the Bible. And they are emotional about it. And if you tell them this is not biblical, they get angry about it. I've experienced but it. But these people can also, like I have a terrible memory. I can't remember passage from passage. I just remember a generalized idea, idea which I think works better for me. But how can people that can cite the Bible and quite literally make you quiet on the subject be able to give you such convincing evidence using the Bible? They can't. I've had discussions with uh, Pentecostals. I have uh, invited Pentecostal pastors to have public debates on it. They won't. Uh, because you cannot support it from the Bible. But then how can they gain more people because in their people, church? How because can... people don't study the Bible. They allow the pastors to feed them whatever garbage they're feeding them. And that's why we invite people every week to go back and study what they're taught. And not only do it what, what they're taught in church, but go and study on their own. Spend more time studying the Bible by yourself than in church. So is the concept of speaking in tongues dead to us? Because as... I'll be stronger uh, than that. To me, I've, I've, I've written on the subject in a theological journal. Uh, and I can conclude without a doubt that it is not from a spirit that is God. And if there's a spirit that is not a godly spirit, I think it is a satanic spirit. It's going to hurt the feelings of some of our people that are watching. But that's what it is. And if they want to challenge me, they can write, they can talk, they can come here and show me from the scripture where, it's not, where, where, where it is not satanic. I can prove that it is. Because uh, we see where it is. It is coming from pagan teachings. It is coming and being used in spirit worship all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the Bible clearly says, don't be part of it. But the Apostle Paul clearly tells us that. I think going back a little, how can something that is revealed to us be so disputable? There are many things that are disputable because people don't read their Bible. People but don't study their Bible. Even, well, if that's for a partial, I would say, for people that do understand it, but maybe it's not, maybe we're just not that level of understanding. Maybe I don't know, but person to person, I guess it differs. But even those who can pick up their Bible every day, don't understand it, or they'll still be a Pentecostal. I, how can I, I would, that I would, I'll tell you how they can do it. I would suggest that they read the first three chapters of the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Or first, uh, second and third chapters of the book of Acts. Then I would suggest that they read chapters 12, 13, and 14. Because chapter 14 is incomplete without the setup in chapter 12. You could go back as far as chapter 11, which talks about order and worship and so on. But you don't need to. You can go to chapter 12, chapter 13. Whatever somebody tells you, it's not the love chapter. Chapter 13 <laughs> is a setup for the answer in chapter 14, of the question of speaking in tongues. All it says is, love is, if you're going to ask for a gift, love is more important than all the gifts. If you don't have love, but you can speak in tongues all day long, forget about it. It's not worth anything. That's basically the message. Okay. okay. So uh, the answer is not in what I believe. And what I say, a young person without any biblical training can read chapter 12, 13, and 14 and get the answer for themselves. It's clear, clear as day. There has to be no discussion or dispute, none. If there is a Pentecostal out there, I challenge you, I invite you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, and you will not want to speak, you will not want to participate in this glossolalia or the speaking in tongues. And it is most certainly not the evidence of the Holy Ghost coming to anybody. Not at all. The evidence of the Spirit of God in us is a changed life that makes us loving, forgiving, gentle mm -hmm. toward people, not speaking in tongues. That is not God leading us. That's somebody else. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for today, Pastor Pagey. And as we discussed today, let's stay informed. If you have any questions, again, leave them for us, and we will try to get to them as always. And we thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you.